What's up guys, I am Morgan Madison, and today I'm giving you a walkthrough of my project for my song Reflect, which is track 11 on my debut album Living the Phantasm, which is out now everywhere on Mousetrap. Um, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to skip through the major portions of the song just to give you an idea of how the song flows and what it sounds like, and then we're going to dive in and talk about how it was made. So here we go. So pretty simple, mysterious, sort of minimal intro here, and then we get to the first drop, which is also pretty minimal. Um, and then what we're gonna do is just start adding elements as the song progresses until it gets more epic sounding like right here. Then we work our way to the middle of the song which has a sort of like ambient emotional vocal break. We get up to the uh, climax. So basically, by the time I had made this song, um, I had most of my debut album done. So Living the Phantasm, pretty much 10 or 11 songs were done. And I knew, I knew I wanted 12 tracks, and the last track, All These Worlds, which is an ambient outro song, um, was also done. And so I needed something for track 11 that was sort of like epic and climactic and sounded really huge and sort of left the listener feeling satisfied from the journey of the whole album. So when I started this song, all I really had was this sort of like eighth note bass beat. Um, everything together is basically what I had at the start, which sounds like this. Just a more minimal, minimal version of that. So what we have here is just a really clean kick drum and a simple, simple eighth note bass. The bass is a little, a little gritty, a little grimy, even though I've cut off a lot of the mid and high end. Um, the bass was made in Arturia Mini V3. I encourage you to check that out. It is a great synth, a great VST, and it's one of my favorites. Um, but basically, super simple bass here. There's not a lot ever going on in the low end of this track. Uh, and that's because there's so much going on on top. I mean, by the time we get to the climax specifically... There's just so much atmospheric grit and stuff going on in the high end that I didn't want to overpopulate the low end because the song was already hard to complete because of how overpopulated and saturated it sounded. So I sort of went back to the drawing board with that simple beat I just showed you at the beginning and I wanted to draw it out longer and for the first three minutes of the song I wanted to sort of add elements the way, sort of the way John Hopkins does stuff in some of his atmospheric techno work, um, where like it feels like things are constantly being revealed, but at the same time you can't really tell where a lot of the elements are coming from. Um, so let's go top down here and talk about some of these vocal samples that are hanging out. I love this because it sounds, it's like sort of some sort of downtune vocal, it sounds, I don't know, it sounds sort of dystopian to me. Then I went in and added this. Um, and as is the case with a lot of my vocals and a lot of my synths um, and really anything I use, it's it has a ton of reverb and delay on it. 
Um, you can see the dry wet's pretty high on some of this stuff, like 30 to 40 percent. Um, it's something to be careful with, uh, and it can that those sorts of effects can easily be overused. Um, and a lot of people will tell you like not to use a ton of reverb. I like it because of the way it sounds, but I end I always end up having to like EQ my way out of it later because everything sounds super cluttered. Um, but I think like it's a crucial part of my sound. And in this track specifically, it's absolutely key to having that huge like noise wall feel um, to some of the elements. But we'll we'll touch on that more in a minute. Um, this is a really cool element here. So some seven or eight years ago, I decided I was going to use this program called Paul Stretch to um, take a bunch of royalty-free samples, maybe some ambient pads, maybe some vocal phrases, things like that, and just stretch them out by like 5,000% so that instead of sounding like a vocal, they just sound like this indiscernible sort of like blending of atmospherics and words because the words just like stretch into each other and stuff like that. I thought it sounded super distinct and um, I used it a lot in my album, Living the Phantasm. Um, so let's dive in and I'll show you what this sounds like. Uh, so yeah, you can hear there that this, these uh, these bits here were probably once words, but they're not anymore. Um, let's actually see what this sounds like without a bunch of delay on it. I actually haven't listened to that in a while. Yeah, that's it, dry. Um, anyway, I think... On the first, one of the first songs on the album, I Hate Portals, I also used this technique and pulled from the exact same sample bank that I had made myself, and it adds just like a really nice, hauntingly beautiful atmosphere to songs, and I'm going to keep using it for sure. Um, I might need to make some new ones uh, for some variety, but um, definitely a key element on my debut album is the, are these sort of like stretched out sounds. Um, let's go down here to the main vocal break. I'll isolate this really quick. I just wanna feel alive in the starlight. I see in your eyes. So these phrases uh, put together here to form the vocal bridge are from a royalty-free vocal pack uh, from Kara. She's uh, probably one of the best-known um, vocal pack creators uh, or vocalists. Um, in EDM, specifically for her like really high quality vocal packs on Splice. Um, in this case, though, as you can tell, I've cut up the syllables quite a lot uh, to make things flow way differently. Um, as a whole, I took the vocal down by seven semitones using Ableton's transpose feature. What that's going to do usually if you detune or downtune your vocal by like seven semitones, it's going to sound really just weird and haunting and sort of distorted and deep and just awkward um but in for this particular track since it's already has this sort of hauntingly atmospheric beautiful aesthetic it actually worked out pretty well and i did my best um in the bottom left i don't know if you can see it but i messed around with the formats and the envelope to sort of make this sound as normal as possible as normal as it could sound for being down tuned by seven semitones um Aside from cutting the phrases up, which I do with a lot of vocals, even if I'm working with a vocalist from scratch, um, I actually do this thing where, this is super simple too, but maybe it's like a nice trick you guys can use. Um, obviously, on some vocals, you want to have a little bit of delay on it by default, just to have like a slight bit of like sauce going around, like the le left and right ear, just a little bit of extra vocal repetitions that are very ever so slight um, so that the vocal doesn't sound super dry. In this case, I have the delay um, right here at the bottom. Really, this delay is only affecting sort of the mid end. But what I'll do is, since these phrases are separated in a way that is not natural, um, if I didn't have reverb and delay on this, there would be an awkward sort of unnatural pause in between. So what I did was, and I'll do this a lot too, to sort of fill up this awkward spacing between the phrases that I've cut apart, I will just automate the delay and bring it up from like 9% to 30% dry wet, just to sort of fill this space. So let's see what that sounds like in action here. Mm 
Very subtle, but it keeps the space occupied by something, uh, so that it does sound mostly natural, at least when you're listening to it casually. Um, so yeah, that's a little trick there. This vocal right here is just a repetition to build anticipation for the climax. And as you can see here, I'm using auto filter to just bring the vocal down. You can hear the high end slowly being taken away. And what's actually happening here is the new lead synth is working its way in. This down here. I will use auto filter all the time, especially with um, sort of ambient EDM tracks, I guess you could call that what, what this is, I don't know, but I like to fade elements in and out so that it sounds absolutely smooth. You won't find me doing a lot of hard cuts of different elements. Um, so like, you know, this vocal phrase is fi technically finished right here, but then I let the, the repetition sample linger and sort of bring the lead synth in slowly um, just to like really guide the listener through the journey in a way that's smooth. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense, but let's get down here to the samples section. Um, first of all, if you can't tell yet, I group I group all of my major elements in um, relevant buses. So you got the vocals bus, you got the samples bus, you got the leads bus, you have the soft sense bus, I didn't use that in this case, you have a piano bus that I didn't use, uh, percussion bus, this is like snares, claps, hi-hats, all that stuff. You got the kicks bus because uh, I think we all know sometimes you got to layer a bunch of kick drum samples together to get it sounding right. Um, you got the bass bus and the effects bus and the fills bus. Um, so before we go any further, I just want to let you guys know this is my standard setup for an Ableton project. So when I open up a new project, these buses along with some, you know, empty audio and MIDI tracks will all be filled in so I can just get right to work and it's already organized. Um, anyway, so in the samples bus, this is where we're getting a lot of the character of the track. And it's cool because there's not a single synthesizer in here. It's all just like highly manipulated um, sample work going on. The original ambient pad I had just with the basic idea, the original beat was this one. And with the rest of the track. So lots of cool things being slowly introduced here. Up here we have this little pluck guy. Um, one of my favorite bits are these crystals here. I use these all over the album too. Uh, one track comes to mind where I think I use them a lot. I think it was um, Sunwalker, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, but here's what these sound like. Super ethereal sound uh, with those crystals. Of course, tons of rever reverb and delay as per usual with me. I think you might start noticing a theme. Um, yeah, and with that, with this sort of uh, ambient glacial sounding pad, I find that these crystal samples just really add to the haunting beauty nature of this song and really the rest of the album too. The star of the show in terms of ambience here is this textured pad though. And really what I did here was I took just a normal sounding ambient pad and I totally boosted uh, the high end, cut out the low end, um, and then used multiband dynamics to boost the high end again. So instead of becoming a sort of passive ambient pad, it becomes like almost a full on sustained lead synth because the high end is so textural. Um, and so I slowly introduce it down here. Yeah, it's, you can't even hear it yet. You can hear it slowly coming in. And so what I've done is I've used the transpose feature in Ableton's, uh, the bottom left of Ableton when you have a sample, and I've shifted it around to create notes uh, from just one sustained sample. So what's really cool about this is it's just a sort of one, you know, measure of just casual ambience, and I've turned it into basically like a textured lead. 
and with the rest of the track. And then without this, it sounds okay, but it doesn't sound nearly as full. So without this sort of like fuzzy, scratchy, distorted um, pad here, the song loses a lot of its oomph. And I think that's cool because in a lot of other songs on my album, there's a very clear focus on one element. And in this case, it just sounds like a total wall of noise. Like all of these different samples and atmospherics are working together to sort of present this noise wall where you, you just, it's really hard to tell exactly what's going on, but at the same time, it sounds very focused. Uh, so yeah, I think we just got a pretty, another one here. I forgot this was actually here. Can't even hear it really. Um, so let's go to the leads here, the leads bus. This lead synth initially coming in right here. This lead synth is the same one from Feels Like. I think feels like off of my album um, and which is also a track I've done a t tutorial for I think that song is such a great use of this like sharp slightly distorted lead synth and in this song it starts very very basic and sparse and then towards the bridge as you can see I use the same patch uh, but just with different automation and this is sort of the final like fulfilled melody because throughout the song there's no real catchy hooky melody and then halfway through it's finally introduced to sort of tease this trance climax. Um, so yeah, here, here's the same synth in the bridge just with the rest of the track. As you can tell, covered in just tons of rever reverb and delay. I'm boosting the, down here you can see I'm boosting with an EQ. I don't recommend you boost, boost frequencies using an EQ, uh, but I have in this particular case. Uh, I don't really know why, but it worked. Um, but sometimes this can really get out of hand when you're using EQ curves to boost frequencies. Generally, you only want to use subtractive EQ. In other words, taking things away, like the high end over here, I'm taking the high end, um, just some of that harsh noise off the off the high end. Um, so yeah, so then we build, we finally tease the complete fulfilled uh, lead synth melody, and then we work our way into the climax here. Um, this part coming up was so hard to get right, because I'm keeping all of this noise wall stuff in, especially this. Um, but I'm also tacking on just this incredibly intense, super um, high maintenance uh, lead synth here. Uh, as you can tell, lots going on there. So the big challenge here was I wanted something that, like this lead synth has a lot of distortion in it and it feels very it's it's um taking up a lot of a lot of the room in the high end so once i got this uh bridge melody going here with this synth i knew what the climax of the track was going to be and i i had no plans of creating a tr basically a trance song here which is kind of what this sounds like uh but once you know this bridge melody had basically revealed itself to me i knew that it had to be like a climax melody because it feels so triumphant and there's just so many notes in it and I don't know I just really love it uh, but yeah it took a lot of work because there's so much like listen to the climax um, I'll isolate the samples for you here like that's just a lot already um, and then you add the vocal atmospherics here and then plus a lead synth So lots of EQ, lots of level changing, lots of mixing, lots of iso using isotopes, neutron to sort of cancel out frequencies that are interrupting each other just to get that sitting right. I had a problem with this for a while where I w the whole track was sounding great, except this, this ending section, no matter what I did, I couldn't get it to stop distorting and clipping 
when I brought it out for mastering. Um, so yeah, it was just this part was like a real struggle for me. It was one of the hardest parts on the album for some reason for me to finish. Um, other than that, we had this uh, bent, sustained sort of bent uh, lead synth here that adds a lot of character to the second half of the climax. And yeah, so that that sort of, this is just a final triumphant sort of sustained synth note because if you have like a minute long climax in a, you know, a trance drop like this, it can get very, very boring because of how intense the elements are and the lead synth is just constantly in your face and present. So that was just a final additional piece here to sort of break the uh, boredom, if you will. Um, and then that sustained uh, bent lead has an instance of it in the outro. Uh, let's go over the percussion here. Nothing too crazy going on. I think the star of the show in the percussion is this sort of like this loop that just is present for the entire track. It sounds like a bunch of stuff being thrown around in a washing machine. <laughs> um, let me blow up this EQ here. As you can see, I left a lot of the low end present in this. Um, which is usually not good practice. You don't want to leave a lot of low end in your drum loops. Uh, you want the kick and the bass to occupy the low end pretty much, unless you really want to go in and automate stuff like in between the kick and the bass and have some other low end, maybe like an accent kick that's like offbeat, things like that. Um, but in this case, I felt that really the low end uh, with this uh, eighth note bass and the kick drum was just so minimal that I could sort of afford to leave this just really like weird washing machine sounding drum loop in it. And I think it sort of adds to the like dark, mysterious, sort of hauntingly beautiful sound in its own way as well. This almost sounds like a sped up version of some burial loop or something. Um, as you can see here, I'm using auto filter to automate the sort of as track track gets more intense, I bring the high end out, and then I use auto filter to take the high end away, like I'm about to do in a second, as you can see. Boom, high end's gone, more subtle, and then we bring it back up to just add to the intensity of different parts of the track. Let's see what else I got here. I think this clap should be pretty simple. Oh, it's a hi hat. Very simple hi hat, closed hi hat. What do we got here? Okay, so this is cool. Um, I have a snare here that is just like has delay stacked on it and it's side chain to the kick just to add some bits like a snare going in and out of the left and right ear just to add some variation. And then what's this? Yeah, again, sort of a washy sort of burial style uh, loop just to give the beat some uh, some texture and some some sauce, some sauce, if you will. I don't know what that means. Um, we have a little block here. Okay, so this is cool. This little block thing I have here, basically it serves the same purpose as a clap or a snare. It's like boom, cha, boom, cha, except this block sample is just way more subtle. What I've ended up using this for in a variety of songs is just to, to fulfill that purpose of a clap or a snare, but not have it have such a dominating presence. I use this in um, I use this first in my track Velen, which is um, the first song on my Some Nights EP on Mousetrap, uh, which was released back in November, I believe. Um, but it's just a nice, subtle little addition. It starts right here. With the beat, you can barely notice it, but it's giving you a sense of rhythm that you don't have without it. Let's take it out and see what that sounds like. Much more empty, in my opinion. Um, let's see what else we have going on here in the percussion. Just a high end, um, very subtle high texture of a snare to add some character. Very simple clap. 
Another very simple clap. Um, and then all of the percussion comes back together in the climax. Look how many elements are stacked on top of each other. I just, it was such a pain to get this working. I mean, every element in the song is going at once at the end here. Like every single, every single element is just going in tandem. So let's isolate the percussion. Yeah, see, this already sounds overpopulated. And when you add the rest of the song, Uh, so yeah, that's that. I think we went over kick and bass. There's a, there was a different bass idea I had in here that is muted that didn't make it into the final version. It sounds like this. Uh, the reason I opted for this eighth note bass instead of this is because, um, like we said earlier, there's just so much going on in this track that if you have this bass going, this bass has a bunch of texture on it and automation and, you know, cut off stuff going on and um, contour and things like that. It just sounded very um, overpopulated. It wasn't really necessary to go that hard on the bass. We have a pretty, we have a dry saw bass here. Sort of the calm, um, mysterious nature of this bass is to contrast with the drops on either side. I use I use dry saw basses in the bridges and the intros of my songs all the time. I think they are endlessly usable because they're simple, they're subtle, you barely notice them, and they add so much attitude uh, in terms of like a building sort of feel uh, to a track. Um, so you'll find me using these all the time. Let's see what else we got here. Effects. I've talked about effects in um, one or two of my other tutorials. I've done I've done a tutorial for Start Again and Feels Like off of my album so far. Uh, with effects, I don't go too crazy with effects because um, to me as a listener, it's it's what I hear the least in a song. Um, effects like white noise, cymbals, um, impacts, things like that are they're not very tonal. They don't really serve a melodic purpose. Uh, to me, what they really do is they just take the listener from one section of a song to another, almost like a more subtle version of a drum fill. So like, if you can find effects that work really well for you, I would suggest keeping them around, reusing them until it gets you know super old. Um, I'm still reusing effects here from the Some Nights EP, some of these. Uh, really standard, this is like cymbals. What's this up here? More white noise, uh, a pre-clap, a big clap, an impact, I love really subtle huge atmospheric claps before drops like let's look at this one. Uh, lots of reverb stacked on all these effects, and then to keep things mixed well and uh, clean, I just I just uh, side chain all the white noise and everything to the kick very tightly, so things don't sound, you know, messy. We have some more white noise, some swells right here. And then um, it's always nice to have a boom, usually in the middle to the end of some of my tracks, I'll add this sort of like mid to low end subtle boom just to sort of like bookend um, something like on a big system you'll definitely be able to feel the boom so it's just sort of like subconsciously letting people know like hey something dramatic's happening here and it's also might be over uh, with that. Can't even hear it really on headphones. Um, Let's look at my drum fills. Uh, I said in another tutorial that I really liked 80s style toms, like straight up Rick Astley style 80s toms. 
And the reason for that is I think acoustic drums have way more character, but 80s style drums just sort of poke through better. Um, and in a style like electronic music that isn't supposed to sound acoustic in the first place, I think the 80s style drums just pair really well with um, electronic sounds, basically. Uh, I went over my techniques for 80s style drum fills uh, in another video, but I will do it again right here. So, basically, I was a drummer before I was ever a producer, and what I liked about the drums was the subtlety of like drum fills, the ghost notes, like you know, hitting toms, light versus hard, and every every uh, you know, everywhere in between. And so, let's this drum fill as a whole is basically supposed to simulate a drummer sort of warming up on the snare drum and then like moving to the rest of the kit. And it sounds like this. So we have some little ghost notes here. This is just the like the little like startup of a snare roll, basically, if you were a drummer. Um, and then the rest here is just the 80s toms. Um, here I, it's just one tom sample, but it's transposed using it's using Ableton's transpose feature to sort of hit different notes. Um, seems like you're going to the deeper toms, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then we have a texture down here. This basically just adds some of that classic 80s like white noise to the top of the drums. Makes them sound more washed out. I first like got hooked on uh, 80s drums and electronic music through Porter Robinson's 2014 Worlds album. <clears throat> uh, he, I think he did some interviews around that time explaining why he likes them as well. And so I thought I thought it was very astute some of the points he was making about 80s toms and electronic music um that's enough about 80s toms i guess um yeah and we have more let me see yeah just the same tom in a different layout and then we have i think this is an acoustic fill over here yeah Um, well, this is something cool here. So this is like a, just a standard sort of EDM style snare build, like 16th note snare build. But what I like to do with this sometimes, what I don't like about some house tracks or EDM tracks or whatever is when the snare, just they take a snare roll and they go like eighth notes, 16th notes, and then just double down, double down, double down until the drop. And then it just sounds like a dry version of a snare sample being cut in half continuously. Um, so what I like to do usually as you know, as the build up until the drop continues, I'll sort of echo out with some reverb. And at the same time I'm doing that, I will take out, gradually take out the low end of the snare build. So basically, the snare build turns from a traditional EDM build right here. And later on, it turns to white noise. Um, to me, I think that serves as a better contrast with, like, if the snare build slowly slowly fades out and gets more subtle and sort of gradually turns into white noise and then the drop hits after that, I think that's a better contrast than just a continuous snare build straight into a drop. That's just me, um, and that's how I do that. Let's see what else we got here. Um, I use the same sort of reverb automation and auto filter and volume automation on my master channel as well. So let's sort of move down to that now that we've done fills. You can see here throughout the track, I have the uh, volume automation highlighted. So fading in at the beginning, before every major section, I like to actually bring the volume down, take the bass out, and then bring the volume back up and the bass back in in unison. I think it adds a lot of drama to a drop and even in a calm song, uh, it's, a, it's a great effect. So you can see here before this drop, I'm bringing it down, bringing it down, bringing it down hits around negative 3 dB, and then I suddenly bring the track back up to normal 0 dB volume. It's uh, not much you're really going to notice when you're listening um, on headphones or whatever, but you know, if you're in a club or a huge system, it, it really does make a subconscious difference with people who are listening. I do the same thing on the rest of the way. I bring the volume down by a 1 dB during the bridge just to have it give it more of a calm feel then towards the end here for the climax i bring the volume down to 1.8 negative 1.8 db and then down super suddenly right before the drop and then bring it back up really dramatically so just to sort of highlight the climactic feel uh, 
Uh, in tandem with that, let's move to the auto filter automation on the master. Um, there, are, you know, some people say putting auto filter on anything too much is a bad idea because, um, you know, it can cause some transient issues and things like that. The way I use it, I haven't really encountered that, so it's not a problem for me. Um, so make your own choices on that. But uh, just like I automate the volume before every major drop, I automate automate taking the low end out. So as you can see here, the auto filter works up, takes the low end out, and brings it back in super fast, very suddenly right here. No low end, all of a sudden, all of the low end. And I do that throughout, um, even in little transition points like right here. Uh, makes a huge difference on a big system, in my opinion. One thing that I also do on my master track is I automate reverb. Um, now this is definitely a bad decision, but I do it anyway. Um, and then I try to like save myself uh, with some EQ. So, and I don't do it too often, but what I do is I take a reverb, like let me find the reverb that's doing this here. Yeah, this one. As you can see down here, I've, I've cut out the low, like the reverb is only affecting the mid to the high end. Um, and I do this to sort of spread, a, like if a song's building toward a major section, I'll use this reverb technique to spread the song out, make it sound out of reach and huge and sort of spread out. And then I will condense everything um, when the drop hits. It's just sort of like, it just adds a dramatic feel to a drop and... Um, you know, it, it adds to the feeling of focus that a drop brings uh, if it's if it's been everything's been reverbed out right before it. So bringing it up, bringing it up, bringing it up, and reverb comes down right here super suddenly. Uh, so yeah. Those are some tips and tricks on my master track here. Uh, before we go, let me just take you through my master bus. What's on my master bus before I, um, this is not the, ma like, this is the master bus basically. And, and what this is, is when I export this song, the only thing that's left to do is some extra compression in ozone and to get that last four dB. So basically my mastering process for my own tracks is just compressing and maximizing and squeezing that last 4 dB just to get it up to industry standard volume. So the first thing on my master track is this plugin called A1 Stereo Control. I don't remember if I showed this in my other tutorials, but um, A1 Stereo Control is just a clean and easy way to automate your stereo field of your tracks. You can see here I'm going all the way. This is mono. This is 200% stereo width. I always hang around 120. Um, and then the only other thing I use in this plugin is the output knob. So I'll take my tracks down between 4 and 7 dB just so that it's quiet enough for the rest of this master bus to do its work without distorting. Um, so yeah, we have a, I have this mastering cube down here, let's call it the mastering cube. Um, this cube contains a lot of things that you know, you should be doing anyway in your tracks, like mix glue, uh, sub compression, stereo width, even more stereo width, EQ booster. I don't really know what this does. Uh, it should be called EQ sauce, uh, whatever. Uh, more volume I, is just compression, um, and sub mono is very important. Uh, I always keep my sub frequencies, the super low end, always in mono, so that the low end is very driving and punchy from any way you hear it. And the high end is really what has the wide range. And there are synths over here, synths over here, stuff like that. But you always want your low end, like your super low end, straight down the middle, um, in my opinion. Unless you really, really know what you're doing. I kind of don't, so I always go sub mono. So yeah, let's listen to the track with this master cube on and off. That's on. That's off. A uh, pretty huge difference. I use this thing in all my tracks to sort of give every single one of my songs a unified feel of sound design, even if they are far apart in genre. Um, I think it really helps to sort of give my catalog a holistic feel. Next thing we have on the master chain is just a multiband dynamics. I've said before that 
you know, I don't know if multiband dynamics on your master is a good or bad thing. I have no idea. But the reason I like it is just I can measure highs, mids, and lows in a way that's just like very visible. You'll see here I boosted the highs by 2.3 dB. That's because my tracks tend to have a more dominant low end when I'm producing. Uh, and towards the end, I have to sort of like recover the high end to give it more presence and texture. Also, the more high end that your tracks have, the more loud they're going to appear to the human ear. So that's a little trick. Just be careful of how much high end you do add because you don't want the track to be too hot and abrasive to the human ear. But if you do add more high end, we're talking between 2 to 4 dB of high end is going to make a lot of difference in terms of how loud your song is perceived. We have a limiter here just for my own OCD to make sure nothing's clipping. Then we stack the, this reverb is not active most of the time. This is the automated reverb that is only used twice on the master. The auto filter is, this is the one we're automating to take the low end out throughout the track. We have another instance of A1 stereo control. I have no idea why that's there. Got no answers for that. Um, limiter right here. I'm boosting the track by 1 dB just to sort of gradually make it louder. Um, and I'll do this really like throughout the track on these various buses. I'll have limiters on there that are boosting the track by like 1 to 2 dB. And then same with like the master bus down here where it's like limiters doing a little bit of work each. Somebody asked me before, I think, why I don't just have one limiter at the end doing all the work. And <clears throat> I've never used another limiter besides Ableton's limiter. Um, and in my experience, Ableton's limiter can't take too much stress without distorting. So for me, if I use multiple limiters at various stages throughout the track, I can get the song sounding nice and loud and compressed without one limiter doing all the work and sort of like struggling to carry that entire load. Um, that's how I do it. This right here is very important. This is this last EQ8 is basically what, what, what I'm doing here is going through and fishing for nails against a chalkboard sort of resonant frequencies that sound like crap um, and can really sound bad when amplified. So in the EQ, we're going to go down, and this blue headphone button is going to allow us, when we click a particular EQ curve, it's going to allow us to hear what we're automating. So with that blue headphone parameter on, I'm going to show you how I go fishing, basically, for bad frequencies. I've selected EQ6 here. You can hear some relatively painful high end right there. Carved it out. Um, I turn the EQ curves to about 8 to get this sort of narrow curve. Um, so let's check out number 7. Yeah, sounds like crap. Some of these other others are doable. But that one is right here. Don't want that in there. Let's check out this. That one's super bad. Also pretty bad. Um, in my experience, these sorts of frequencies that are bad for the ear are mostly into, in the mid to high. Although if you do have like, I don't know, a bass stacking wrong with something, like you'll find some of these down here in this low end. But I found that most of it's like mid to high. Uh, last thing on my master is actually this plugin called Gullfoss. Now. This might be bad practice, uh, but it helps me mentally to sort of let go with, you know, going totally OCD on that final level of polish. I only use two parameters in this plugin. Um, and what this plugin does, I use the recover and the tame parameter. This plugin uh, basically takes, I think what the company did was they developed an algorithm for the average perception of a human ear. And they've developed this plugin to just recover frequencies that are being lost and to tame frequencies that are too dominant. And what this does for me is it allows me to introduce an element of objectivity to giving my track that final polish because if I didn't have this, I'd be sitting back going crazy about every single bit, every single extra dB of high end and all that crap, and I would never get anything done. Uh, so in this this case, um, let's play the track and I'll mess around with it. I'm using the recover parameter to just recover some of the high end that's buried. Um, if you go too high with this, it gets really tinny. You can see how much we're boosting the high there. None of it, and the track sounds a little too subdued for my taste. 
25% is great. Um, in this particular instance, and this is rare for me, the bass sort of was sitting right in my opinion, but the tame parameter is going to tame frequencies that are too dominant. And so let me mess with this so you can hear what that sounds like. Look how much the low end it's taking out. Uh, so yeah, another another thing that's cool about this plugin is um, you can actually specify like what frequency range you're going to affect with it. So check that out. If you only want if, if you're having some issues in this range, you, know, you can do that. Bring it over to this range, whatever you want. Um, I usually use full range unless I hear something that doesn't need to be affected and then I'll carve it out like that. If that maybe there's some high end that doesn't need any work done. Um, but yeah, then one final limiter with an additional dB of compression. You can see here the limiter is subtly working, uh, subtly crushing that high end and maximizing it. And again, um, that's my workflow. And by the time we get to the end of the master channel here, basically what's happening is just I'm going to literally export the uh, the the wave, and then I'm going to bring it into ozone and just get to work on subtly getting that next four to five dB, and then um, that'll be the master after that. So there is no other mastering work except compression for me personally on my own original tracks um, after I've done the Ableton session. So yeah, um, thanks for tuning in, guys. I hope there was something valuable for you there. It was probably a really long rant. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but whatever. Um, that's my song, Reflect. That is track 11 off of my debut album, Living the Phantasm. It's out now everywhere on Mousetrap. Go check it out. Uh, DM me anywhere. Let me know what you think. Maybe you like it. Maybe you don't. I want to hear what you think anyway. Um, so yeah, thanks for hanging out. That is the project file for Reflect. Peace out, guys.